Good evening. Good morning. Hello, wherever you are, and welcome to Good evening. Slight of Mouth. Good morning. Hello, wherever you are, and welcome to Good Good Slight of Mouth. Good morning. Wow. Hello, wherever you Sorry, are. I got my... Sorry, guys. <laughs> welcome to Slight of Mouth with Robert Diltz, a man who needs no introduction, and Oksana. We are very much looking forward to this uh, amazing event and uh, we we are waiting for this event for many, many years because this is first time when Robert Dilts personally is going to explain about Slide of Mouse live online. First time in the history. Yeah, and Slide of Mouse is 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 really it, it, it's it's an amazing model. It, it it's so attractive and, and it's so useful and it's amazingly popular. I think maybe Robert, it might be fair to say that it's it's kind of a prism that shows all the different colors of NLP. It's uh, you can see everything there. Absolutely. And, yes. uh, we are going to invite Robert on screen with us. <laughs> Let's go. Here he is. Oh, Magic is starting. <laughs> hey, welcome, Hi. Robert. Thank you, thank you both. And and I just want to say, you know, we we, we have, hear you. We can't hear you. Your, oh. your sound's off. Okay. You should be able to. Yeti, hear. maybe. Can you hear me Hello. now? Well, in any case, you, can we you know that uh, well, just, yeah. we were just talking with Robert, and oh. he was so excited to, yeah. to be starting here. I, I think maybe the the fuse must have blown out of his uh, no his microphone or something because of no the interest and excitement. We'll be right with you though. In but, any case, yeah, and can certainly you, can, we have can, so can, much can, to. To look forward to and so much to share here. This is uh, really a special event for all of us, and we're we're really looking forward to to this to this model because we we found over and over again. Robert, are you on? <laughs> because no, I can't hear. Володя, can you help us with this? This is. Uh, can you? Is it possible now? This is. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Sometimes uh, have it's. Do you Some hear me now? Interesting things at the beginning. Let's see. Can, can, In any can case, you hear me? we have uh, about uh, we we have uh, more than uh, one thousand uh, participants uh, pre-registered to this uh, introductory webinar. Yeah, that's it, this is uh, this is really a, a great turnout, yeah. and it demonstrates, I think, the the wide widespread interest in in sleight of mouth because mm -hmm. it's. Uh, it's it's so useful. I, I think Robert told us that uh, of, of the thirty five books or forty books that he's written, Sight of Mouth is a perennial bestseller because people really are interested. And, and now, finally, uh, at least in theory, we have a chance to yeah. to to explore this uh, in light of a lot of the modern um, uh, discoveries and approaches and and new things that Robert's opened up. So this is. Uh, when I when I thought about sight of mouth as kind of a, a prism, I think uh, this is this is really a way that uh, we can. That Oksana is stopping Part me. Participants are writing. We can hear Robert. That's ah. great. You can. You guys. They can hear oh, me now. I can. Now I can hear okay. you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, that's great. Uh, now I can. <laughs> so we can hear Robert. So, you can't hear me. Okay. Ah, it's on YouTube. We're not getting okay. him on Zoom. Okay, oh. that's great. Robert, I'm going to stop. Please, <laughs> please take over. So now we really give microphone to Robert from the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank you. And I, I, I just want to say. Okay, let's go. Valodia, I just want to say how how much fun it's been also to work with you both. Uh, you know, we did a Russian language version of the sleight of mouth already. And so uh, this this is something that you know we're uh, really a, a good team with, and I just want to really honor uh, this opportunity to be working with Oksana and Richard Connor, and and so welcome everybody, welcome to this uh, free webinar, this introduction to sleight of mouth. I'm sure that some of you probably already know about it. Others, it might be that you're just learning. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of what is sleight of mouth. Or we'll be reviewing some of the patterns, how we use it, why it's important. Um, as Richard and Oksana were saying, interestingly, of all the books, which I've now written over 32 books now over the past 45 years, um, of all these books, 
uh, sleight of mouth has been sort of the biggest seller. And I think that's because there is something truly magical about language. And of course, a big part of my background is in the area of neuro-linguistic programming. And the whole notion of neuro-linguistics has to do with this uh, idea that language can change worlds. In fact, um, the subtitle of the volume two, I'm just finishing up uh, Sleight of Mouth volume two, the subtitle is How Words Change Worlds. And in fact, um, I'm going to put up uh, my uh, PowerPoint here because I want to kind of be walking through a little bit of a storyboard uh, about sleight of mouth and you know where it comes from and how we can use it. Uh, so let me share that here. Uh, we'll get our that up also on our, uh, our our projection screen here. We'll wait just a moment. Anyway, the basic idea of sleight of mouth is, we, you know, sometimes it's called the magic of language the power of words. Also, sometimes we call it, um, you know, verbal reframing or conversational belief change. And it really is all of these things. It's it's about how we use language to shift our perceptions, our beliefs, our understanding of the world. So truly, words can change worlds. Uh, words have changed worlds. Um, and more and more, I think we're seeing that Words are are you know significant in changing the uh, you know uh, the world. Uh, so, sleight of mouth, as you see here's the the picture from the book that shows there's a card magician in there. You know, so there's a mouth and there's a card magician in there, and actually that's what the notion of sleight of mouth comes from, is from magic. You know, where a ma magician does some sleight of sleight of hand, and we can do the same thing with words. So, uh, and of course, as we'll see, there's a series of these patterns uh, that make up sleight of mouth. We'll be touching upon these. Um, but as I was saying, the, so sleight of mouth, the word slight in this case comes from an old Norse word, and it means, you know, crafty, or cunning, artful, dexterous. And again, I was mentioning sleight of hand as a kind of an example of this. And they and these patterns that we we explore in the program, and I'll be sharing some with you here, of course, tonight, today. Uh, they have this sort of similar magical quality. We can often create dramatic shifts in people's inner experience, in their perception, uh, by using language, by using the right words. So um, uh, again, we'll be looking at that and. Uh, they come from modeling that I did. I'm, I'm sure many of you know that um, my background is in various kinds of modeling through neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, but also through uh, success factor modeling, SFM. And, uh, you know, I, I've always been fascinated with language and the power of language. Um, and with uh, when I first got involved in NLP, because we do it a lot of modeling, I was looking at how some of the significant people in history uh, use language and what could I understand about the way they were using language. And a lot of the typical NLP, uh, you know, distinctions, verbal distinctions were very interesting, but it didn't quite capture exactly what was happening. And here you see some pictures of, of people that, um, of, of the many that I modeled, but these are examples of people like William Shakespeare, uh, Milton Erickson, I'll be actually sharing some examples. <clears throat> Milton Erickson, uh, I'm sure many of you <clears throat> have heard of him or know that he was a, uh, a very important um, uh, uh, you know, role model in the beginning of uh, the development of neurolinguistic programming. He was a hypnotherapist and a psychiatrist and probably, probably even still today, probably has the, the greatest... Um, uh, you know, sort of record of effective uh, work is, you know, that he was able to uh, create all kinds of change and, you know, various types of healing, mental healing, physical healing. Uh, and so uh, I think he was certainly somebody that influenced me a lot. It was a person that I was able to study with personally. Uh, then there was people like Socrates. I did not study with personally, <laughs> although um the Socratic method is definitely something that's still very much part of our, our world today. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, who was a U.S. president that was known for 
this ability to, you know, first of all, this ability to speak, but also for, uh, you know, bringing uh, freedom and liberty to the African American people. Uh, and uh, uh, Mohandas Gandhi is uh, clearly one of the pioneers and important influences on uh, nonviolent modes of change. And along with him, there's uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Sigmund Freud, of course, there's Jesus. Um, Next, Jesus is Richard Bandler, uh, who are are interesting contrasts, uh, but both you know wonderful people with very uh, you know wonderful um, language abilities. Richard Bandler was in fact really the person that when I I was listening to him doing a work once, and and as you could just see, wow, he was just doing these amazing things with language. But I couldn't, you know, the, the typical uh, NLP uh, descriptions didn't really, you know, capture it. And so it's one of a very important stimulus for this. And then there's uh, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, so we have, you know, media, literature, philosophy, healing, psychotherapy, religion, politics, law. And all of these are places where we are influencing people through words. Uh, we are changing worlds with words. Um, so, you know, what, what, so how are sleight of mouth patterns used before we get into the more of the details? So they are, sometimes we call them patterns of persuasion. Uh, the sleight of mouth is when we're using language to either confirm or reinforce a belief. You can also use sleight of mouth to introduce doubt, uh, to sway opinions. Uh, to incite action, to create or challenge generalizations, and also to build or protect a particular belief or belief system. So again, there's many, many uses. Again, we, we say the sleight of mouth is when we use words in relationship to beliefs and belief systems. Um, some other applications of how sleight of mouth is used is, for example, with some of these um, role models we were just looking at, in the Socratic method, um, you're unpacking belief statements and examining assumptions. Um, in other cases, you're challenging and transforming limiting beliefs, or sometimes what we call thought viruses. I'll get into that in just a moment. You're oftentimes flipping perceptions of reality that you know you think it's one way, and suddenly you you're, you're, by through the use of these words, you're seeing something in a completely different way. Uh, you can also use language, and it's the sleight of mouth about using language to inspire fervent motivation, to motivate uh, people to do things that could be challenging, risky, uh, effortful. Uh, of course, you can use sleight of mouth to create confidence, but also to connect with something beyond individual identity. We lang Language serves a lot of purposes, and especially the types of patterns, the, these um, language patterns, we work with with uh, sleight of mouth. And as I said, that sleight of mouth is, is using language in a particular way. It's using language specifically at this level of belief. Now, some of you, uh, those of you who know me and have known my work, will probably be familiar with this notion of the um, levels of change pyramid, uh, which is basically saying that, you know, uh, our lives, our realities in a way, are built from different levels. Uh, we have a foundational level in, in our environment, our physical, tangible environment. And sometimes change, of course, happens in that environment. And today we have a lot of change going on in our environment. You know, there are, as we know, there are conflicts, uh, there's climate change, there's, uh, there's technical change, there's many things happening. And that means we have to adapt behaviorally. We have to do things differently. So that means there needs to be a change in behavior. Changes in behavior usually come when we have a change in our way of, of thinking. And here we talk about capabilities. I need to develop new competencies. Um, uh, uh, this whole uh, Zoom work right now, uh, a lot of this happened for many of us because of the pandemic. So we had to develop new competencies, new capabilities to do things. But then... There's also change at the level of values and beliefs. And the, we say these are the changes at the level of, of why. So we could say our environment is where and when we do something. Our behavior is what we do in there. Our capabilities and competences are how we do it. Then our values and beliefs are why. And I put values and beliefs on the same level largely because 
a value doesn't really mean anything without a belief. If I just say, well, my value is health, you would say, well, what does health mean? Then as soon as I start to answer it, I will be giving you beliefs. Similarly, beliefs don't really make any impact unless they're connected to values. If I just say, if I just say, you know, uh, I believe this is green or something, so what? You're going to be connecting this to values. Now, the key thing about beliefs, of course, is that they support and they reflect things at an identity level, the who. You know, so again, when I say I believe, there is an I that's not the belief, it's on some deeper level. Uh, but that, you know, I is holding this belief, but the beliefs often will shape our identity. Because if I say, I am this kind of person, if I say, I am intelligent, I am, you know, uh, an, an NLP trainer, whatever, those are identity level statements. Uh, and then, of course, there's an even higher level be- goes beyond ourself and our identity to a sense of purpose. For you know, we say this is uh, not about who is an identity, but it's for whom, for what. Now, language can express all of these different levels, and language can intertwine them and, and kind of link them together. And w- one of the things is that we'll say, and this is the neuro linguistics of this, is that these levels are also engaging different parts of the nervous system. Likewise, language can engage different parts of the nervous system. Some words only engage very superficial aspects of our our nervous system. We don't, you know, they don't affect us very much. It's just words, you know, it's just a bunch of words. Other times when people say those are fighting words, you know, uh, people will fight over words. People will even, we'll we'll see, you know, people will even risk their life over words. So, Beliefs are very powerful, and and they also influence a lot. Our belief about things influences us. I use, often like to give you know examples. You know, when you think about what role belief plays, uh, uh, one of the very obvious examples is what's known as the placebo effect. Somebody takes a drug that actually has no medicine in it. They think it's a drug. It could be a, a flower pill, or it could be an injection of a, a just a solution that has no drug. But if they believe it surprisingly, surprisingly high percentage of people can have dramatic physiological changes. They're not just sort of imagining the change, the change is happening. There's even been examples, I've done a lot of studies of placebo and the placebo effect. And there's even a really interesting example of a a group of women who were given placebo chemotherapy for, for breast cancer. And because they believe they were getting this chemotherapy, a third, one third of the women getting the placebo chemotherapy lost all of their hair. Now, there was no reason for them to lose their hair except for this impact of belief. Now, belief also affects our performance, what we believe uh, we can do and what's possible. Well, one of my favorite examples of that is um, the the example of uh, Roger Bannister, who was uh, the first person to run a mile in less than uh, five, uh, sorry, the five minute mile, less than five minutes. For many years before that, all the best runners, the best athletes were trying to break this barrier and it was considered an, you know, an, an uh, you know, impossible barrier to break. And every time, of course, that people didn't do it, you know, they would say, see, that proves it. It's not possible. Then, and I think it was 1954, Roger Bannister ran a mile faster than five minutes and the interesting thing was, within a couple of months, somebody else did. And within the next couple of years, something like 200 people had done it. So, you know, is that mean that suddenly humans, you know, <laughs> evolved further? Or just that it was our belief that had been holding us? Belief also affects our ability to learn. It affects our sense of our intelligence. There's a, been a, an example of this that's been repeated multiple times, where you take a group of students that have average IQ, you put one half uh, to give one half to a teacher and tell them these students are extremely intelligent. You give the other half to a group and say, oh, they're really slow. And you don't even tell the students anything. You only tell the teachers. And the interesting thing about this research is when you come back a, a year later and you assess the IQs of these students that were all average, all 100, the ones that were given to the teacher that was, was told that they were intelligent, their scores have actually gone up and IQ is not supposed to change. The other group has gone down. So belief has an extremely big impact in our lives. 
And, you know, and it can have positive impact or negative impact. It's a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, beliefs are responsible for all of the greatest achievements of the human of human beings. You know, we have to believe that you can create a flying machine before you create one. You have to believe that you can get well in order to get well. You have to believe that you can make the technologies that we're using right now that did not exist even you know 25 years ago. Um, you have to believe that this is possible and that it's important and that it's worth it and that you can do it. So now. The, one of the biggest challenges and one of the other reasons for the development of sleight of mouth is because there's things like limiting beliefs. Uh, there are beliefs that hold us back. There's beliefs that keep us, you know, uh, keep us small. There's beliefs that keep us, uh, make us unhealthy. Um, and there's what I call thought viruses. And a thought virus is a special kind of limiting belief uh, because it's actually a belief that I didn't come up with myself. You know, there's there's a lot of beliefs that we build based on our own experience. We have an experience. We try something. It's something that we're cognitively, consciously working out. But frankly, many of our beliefs, probably more of those uh, than than the ones we cognitively, consciously have tried to you know decide. These beliefs are what something that we picked up. Uh, probably even long before we were had a, had you know an adult conscious mind you know as children we're constantly picking up beliefs and we pick up beliefs that are not just because of we've thought about it we grow up in a family system in a cultural system uh in, in today you know you've got all kinds of influences and so these are uh beliefs that we build not on our own experience but on other people's beliefs um and very often, again, we we they're unconscious. We're not thinking about them. Uh, they're coming in. Uh, we're, we're, our focus is somewhere else, but they're kind of coming in in the background. So um, many of these thought viruses are unconscious. So I say I, I call them a virus because you know if you think about this recent pandemic we've been through, you catch you, you catch COVID from somebody else. But when you catch it, it you know it affects you, and you even reproduce it. That's why you can infect other people. So it's, it's and it's a bit like this thought virus or a computer virus can do the same thing. So one of the things that we need, and it's one of the reasons, especially I've, I've focused on this a lot in the slide of mouth volume two, is what could be a kind of a virus detection system that where we could actually, as we listen to all of the things that are coming in, and especially. You know, in today's world, we know again in this in this this world of um, political conflict, economic conflict, uh, climate issues, health issues, that we're bombarded with all kinds of beliefs. Uh, and how do we know which ones are worth having? Now, one of the big challenges is oftentimes, and I this is a, I think this is an important point here. You have a belief and you need to have a belief when you do not know what is real. And much of our lives, we have to make decisions where we don't really know what's real. We haven't been there. Uh, we don't have all the data. We have incomplete information. Uh, that information can be distorted. So in many ways, the belief's intention is not to be real. You know, uh, there's sometimes people say, you know, well, when I see it, I'll believe it. I say, well, then it's too late <laughs> and you don't need to believe it anymore um, because believing it means, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've worked so often with beliefs. I work a lot with beliefs in the areas, for example, of things like uh, businesses and startups and entrepreneurs, but also in areas like health. And I tell you, you know, people have to believe that it's possible to be healthy at the time when they're the least healthy. I mean, otherwise you give up. Uh, same thing with entrepreneurs. You need to believe that you can succeed at the time when it seems like reality is the most opposite, so that belief is not supposed to simply mirror reality. The purpose of belief is to change reality. And that's why I say, you know, these, these are words that change worlds. So um, one of the things that keeps these thought viruses going are what are called confirmation bias, meaning that you have a belief. And rather than go and check and, and you know go through a very thorough checking, we actually you know have these biases that just keep them going. One is called attention bias. 
That is that we we just focus attention only on the things that confirm what we already believe in, and uh, we ignore anything that discounts it. You see this all the time. You see this again. You'll see you'll see it in trials. You'll see it, in, of course, in political arguments. We we've all done it. We've all experienced the frustration when it happens uh, when somebody's doing it to you. Um, another one is called uh, interpretation bias, bias interpretation. That all right? We we both have the same information, but we interpret it differently. I interpret it according to my belief. You interpret it according to your belief. You, you can see this, and I've seen this. We you have some kind of a fact. You go look. Here's a fact, and the person actually just interprets it a different way. So this is one of the big challenges uh, of of how do we how do we begin to get positive change if somebody's really stuck or really limited. Another one of these biases is memory bias, that we selectively only remember the information that supports our views. It's easy to forget, you know, and you'll see this, you know, you hear this, of course, in a lot of these high profile trials, you know, well, I can't recall, you know, I don't remember. Uh, So it's easy to forget the stuff that doesn't support what we want. And what we want to believe, especially when it has, you know, strong emotional connotations. These are the reality that we live in. It's when it's, we're not saying that it's, it can't say that it's good or bad or right or wrong. It is what happens. And it's part of what we have to be able to deal with in our own ex- personal experience, as well as with others. So what do we do? And, and, and what makes a limiting belief? Uh, where are some of these limiting beliefs come from? So uh, just uh, another source of what we would call these kind of thought viruses, limiting beliefs, come from what uh, Francis Bacon, who was from 100, this is now 100 years ago, uh, Francis Bacon was sort of a contemporary of Shakespeare, so back in the 15, 1600s. And he was kind of considered one of the, you know, the, the, the pioneers of, of modern science. But he talked about what he called these four idols of the mind. Our minds have idol. Now, you know, an idol means it's it's kind of something that you worship. <laughs> but oftentimes, you know, we talk about a false idol. This idol is representing something. Um, and he said, kind of our first basic idol is what he calls the the idol of the tribe, that we as humans are a tribe, and that we tend to think that our perception of the world is actually mirrors it. <laughs> I mean, even right now, like we say, okay, I'm, what I see in front of me, it's accurately mirroring reality. And yet, there are so many illusions that can be created. Uh, we know this today, you know, that um, it, 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 even, uh, for example, um, uh, you know, we we can uh, we, you can do deep fake. You can create. And there was all the Photoshop things. Uh, there are many things that are are you know not an accurate mirror of reality. Even what we think we perceive, because um, we have our sensory filters. So <clears throat> this notion that we think that our map is the territory, and there's often a lot of you know. Um, uh, let, let's say there can be a, a more and less of a big gap there. A second one of these idols, he calls the idol of the cave or the den, uh, which means so we grow up in our own family system. We grow up in our cultural system uh, and we have our education. And so we have our own, so again, this is like our personal biases. And we think that our judgments and our personal experience is the best or it's, you know, it's objectively true. So we don't, you know, we especially if we haven't we haven't spent time in different cultures and everything. We have these cultural biases. We live in these kind of bubbles um, uh, where you have, you know, these uh, so-called you know filtered uh, algorithms that just give us inf- information that we you know are interested in and nothing that we don't want to know. Uh, a third, he calls the idols of the marketplace. And, you know, so right now we're kind of in a marketplace. I'm, you know, we're, we're interacting. I'm using language. I, I'm using words, obviously. And if we just think, oh, we all share exactly the same understanding of these words, that's going to be tricky because we each have, you know, uh, any word, we just have our own personal associations to. That's how we give it meaning. But we'll think that, oh, if they're using that same word, they mean the same thing that I do. Uh, a final one is what he called the idols of the theater. 
uh, which would be, of course, you know, out of words, we build political systems, religions, philosophies, even, you know, scientific understandings. Um, but these, again, he says, well, we're, these are being built off of these other idols, you know, so, uh, you know, these are the ways that we, we, we need to, again, we build our realities here. But if we idolize it and don't examine it, that's where things really get tricky, both in our own personal lives. So sleight of mouth has a very personal impact, but also in our social lives and in our social realities. So sleight of mouth can be used to change our own world. It can also be used to change the bigger world. And um, why is this important? Is kind of as uh, just to sort of summarize some of the things that I've said. More than any other time in history, we're bombarded with potential thought viruses. Uh, you know, it, just it, myself, even in the last few years. I get, you know, from WhatsApp, from, you know, a message, from, you know, emails, from all the kinds of social media, LinkedIn, you know, uh, uh, X, uh, Instagram, etc. cetera. Um, you're getting, you know, bombarded Facebook. So, you know, we have social media, you also, and we know that that gets flooded with, you know, so-called fake news, alter alternative facts, this idea of the al algorithmic editing, where I, I I'm I am so aware of this, you know. I click on some news item, and then I just get a bunch more of that same thing, uh, and I get tired of it. Uh, of course, we know we live in a world where there's a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, uh, we have this development of the so-called metaverse, which means it's a universe that is you know you have, you have cryptocurrency. There, it's it's not that it's money that's not based against you know gold or silver. It's just only created it's all created you can buy you know cyber land that doesn't exist anywhere except in this you know um non-physical universe and of course as we know we're dealing a lot with now big big uh, advances in artificial intelligence and you know virtual reality so we are living more and more in a world where you're not going to be able to reach out and go and touch it and say i when i see it i'll believe it you don't. You won't have that opportunity, or even what you see is not going to be what's really there. You see the little picture, for example, on this slide. It shows uh, one person is chasing another person with a knife. Now, and then you see, if you look closely at the camera, that's the the camera is only focused on a part of this interaction, and it actually, when you if you can see inside, you'll see that that. Uh, picture uh, reverses the reality <laughs> that it looks like the person's foot who's running is a knife and then the other that 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 person is attacking the other and this just shows that you can you know you can distort things you can just take part of something yeah yeah p again people could be looking at this exact same thing and still seeing a completely different reality or and portraying a different reality so this is why this this uh, understanding more deeply uh, the, the, how this happens and how we create these uh, word, worlds, worlds with our words is so significant. Now, what do we do? So uh, how is sleight of mouth used in, in NLP and in what is used effectively? Well, uh, you, we want to be able to identify limiting beliefs and thought viruses. We want to be able to enrich these R maps to not just keep stuck in, in the bubble and just keep in these confirmation biases. We want to be able to create flexibility, have, have new and different legitimate perspectives or expand an existing perspective or see an old perspective from a new point of view. These are all the things that sleight of mouth is designed to do through words. And of course, I'll be giving you some examples in just a moment. Um, so, one thing we often do is you'll notice that I can be talk about the same situation. I can be talking about it either as a problem, you know, so I can say, oh, well, this, you know, they're struggling here. You know, you, uh, for example, you could uh, take, um, I don't know, any one of our current situations. We could talk about climate change and we can talk about what's the problem to be avoided. Why is it a problem? Who's caused it? Whose fault is it? But what you can also do is switch to what we call an outcome frame. Well, so what do we want? How can we get that? What resources are available? Um, if you stay stuck in a problem frame, everything is a problem. <laughs> I mean, it, you can create a lot of problems and the world is full of problems. If you switch to the outcome frame, then you, you know, and again, it's, you could be talking about the exact same situation. Let's like, you know, give, be giving you some examples. 
Uh, but this is one of the, this is just one example of the kind of things that you're, we would do uh, and we learn to do when using sleight of mouth, what these books are about. Limiting beliefs, as it says, are often uh, stated in a problem frame. Now, here's where we start to go. I'm just going to give you a little bit of insight into then, well, what is sleight of mouth? How does it work? First thing is, um, we say that beliefs, the language of beliefs has a structure. It's it's neuro-linguistic. That means that, so not every word that you say is a belief. Not every sentence that you say is a belief. A belief typically has a particular structure. And that structure is usually some kind of a cause and effect or some kind of equivalence. That means something is creating something or causing something or something is causing something else or something means something. Well, this means that. And uh, then giving here some examples of kind of common limiting beliefs. I, I run into these. These are actually some of these are from uh, some of the sleight of mouth programs I've done um, or programs where, I, where we've explored sleight of mouth. You know, if I speak, people are going to laugh at me. That's an, a cause and effect. If I speak, people will laugh at me or no matter what I do, I'll never get enough. Now you'll notice these are also big generalizations, and this is the other thing that that beliefs are, do in our lives is they create these generalizations, and we have to live based on generalizations. We make judgments based on generalizations. We guide our lives based on generalizations. Uh, and so now notice, of course, these are put in a problem frame. You know uh, they, uh, that some people are going to laugh at me. I'm never going to have enough. One of the things you, we see that we'll be doing with something like sleight of mouth is turn that into an outcome frame. Oh, well, so what do you want? What would be the outcome? Would you want to be confident? Uh, do you want to be skillful with language? What is what what is it that you want? Same thing. Well, I will never get enough. Well, so obviously, you would be nice to have enough. Let's explore what what it would mean to have enough. What are some things that you could do? You said no matter what I do, have you done every single thing? So, you know, these are where we start to kind of use, when, once we can understand a structure, we can begin to make some, we, you know, we said kind of operate on that. And that's what these sleight of mouth patterns are. They're all different kinds of operations. Uh, sometimes the cause effect is reversed. You know, I'm, I, I'm not capable because I failed in the past. Uh, I, what I want is important because other people's needs take precedence. Again, these are common things that you'll hear. Some maybe some that you even say yourself or have said yourself. Um, now, again, this is the linguistic part. And what happens, of course, is that when these words resonate with something, then it's not just words anymore. You start to feel it. Uh, people can become very emotionally attached, as we know, to, to different kinds of beliefs. And that's where uh, also the confirmation bias will begin to you know, come in. So what do we do with these? What is sleight of mouth about? Uh, you know, so here we now we've identified this belief. And and remember, you have to make sure that you get that structure because that's going to be important. So what do we do? And as I said, these sleight of mouth patterns are their operations on these limiting beliefs. And I'm not obviously we're not going to go all, all, all 14 here. I want to give some examples though, so you get the sense of how it works and the kind of thing that we explore in the workshop. Uh, because in the workshop, you know, we go through these patterns. We take limiting beliefs of our own or others that we want to, um, you know, bring more, you know, enrichment to, and we, you know, we're practicing developing this as a skill so that we can use language like some of the people who have really made, you know, a big difference in the world and a diff big di difference in other people's lives. Milton Erickson, who I mentioned before, was one of them and was a big inspiration for me. And as I said, he was able to be successful in so many different areas. And uh, we just was going to give a couple, just a few examples of things that's uh, what, why, you know, I, why I was wanting to understand well, what's going on here and how do we make a map of this? So uh, one of the sleight of mouth patterns is called redefine. And I'll just give you an example of how Erickson would, again, use language this way. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a young woman he was working with who was like pr probably in either in her late teens or early 20s, a college age, uh, you know, uh, young woman. But when she was a, 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 like a, uh, in her, um, uh, like probably, in, you know, uh, 12, 13, uh, she was in a car accident and got a cut uh, on her above her lip 
which she thought was, you know, horrible. She had this scar that was, you know, damaged her face. And of course, she associated with this traumatic event. And so she thought this made her look ugly and she would be constantly hiding it. You know, she would, when she was spoke or she would often, like she turned her head away. I mean, she was really obsessed with this thing. Uh, and, you know, she, and she said it, you know, it was, it was the scar that was made her horribly ugly. Well, Erickson did this interesting thing. He noticed that she liked to draw. And so he gave her an assignment to go uh, research and draw um, beauty marks. <laughs> and so, you know, she went and drew a bunch of pictures. Then he also had her draw a picture of her own face. And then uh, they were kind of looking at these pictures and suddenly she starts to realize, hey, wait, this thing looks a lot like these beauty marks. <laughs> and so suddenly instead of a, an ugly scar, it became a beauty mark. And again, it's just interesting, you know, the way that you talk about something starts to shift the way that you look at it. Uh, one of my favorite examples, this is another slide of mouth pattern that's known as consequence. Uh, Erickson, for a time, worked in a, um, a, a, a hospital that had a lot, a lot of, you know, fairly, um, um, you know, uh, let's say severe, you know, patients with severe mental disorders. And one person uh, was kind of running around with this delusion that he was Jesus Christ. And so he was wear, you know, wear, wear sheets over him and, you know, try to preach to everybody. And and one day uh, Erickson went up to him and, you know, the, the, by the way, this is an interesting thing about sleight of mouth. Uh, you'll see from all of these Erickson examples, sleight of mouth never tries to directly attack the belief. Like uh, Erickson never said, oh, that scar isn't, isn't ugly. He never said to this person, you're not Jesus Christ. He actually, what he said was, he said, I understand that you have experience as a carpenter. Now, since Jesus was the son, of, you know, as a carpenter's son and, and had, uh, according to the, the Bible, you know, worked as a, you know, worked in his father's trade for a while. Well, he can't say no. You know, well, yes. He said, and, and I, you know, understand that you, you know, really, you like to help people. You're here to help the world. Well, yes. You know, and so, said, well, we're having this project over here where they're really having some trouble. They're trying to build these bookshelves. Could you come and give some advice? And so he used that to get this person kind of involved in this project. And eventually this person began to sort of make friends and, you know, make, make progress. So you see, it's kind of helping to shift. It's giving us other perspective. Another one, we call it chunking down, which means you, you know, uh, when because we said beliefs are a lot about generalizations. And because Erickson worked with uh, hypnotherapy, he had this one person um, who uh, claimed, you know, that, you know, I, I am, I am unhypnotizable. All, you know, these people have tried to hypnotize me and it's never happened. I am, I am unhypnotizable. And Erickson said to him, well, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. You are unhypnotizable. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, all of these unhypnotizable except your arm. And the guy says, what? And he sort of lifts the person's arm and looks at him meaningfully. And, you know, it's, and of course, one of the things we realize is the person is interested in, in hypnosis, but he's probably also very guarded. So by chunking down and saying, well, I'm not putting you into a trance, just your arm, you know, then a whole different, uh, you know, mindset gets activated. And then this person, by the way, his arm, when Erickson let it go, it sort of stayed there and, then this person went on to have very interesting and, and helpful uh, hypnotic experiences. Another interesting example, there was a young lady, uh, probably again, sort of just uh, starting in her teenage years where she was beginning to grow and her feet, her feet were growing faster than the rest of her body. And she just became obsessed with the, the fact that she had these big feet and that they were so unattractive and, um, and she started, you know, not going out. She just wanted to stay inside all the time. And so Erickson sort of worked out with her mother to do a, a house visit because he was a, you know, he was a, also a doctor. Um, so he came over to the house and he sort of maneuvered where he's talking to the mother and kind of actually helping the mother with something. And he sees that the girl is standing just sort of right behind him. And he purposely, on purpose, kind of steps back and steps on her foot. <laughs> and she goes, ouch. And he says, well, you know, if you would grow those feet big enough that a man could see them, this wouldn't be happening to me. And so, and it, you know, it's like, so he's making what we call a counterexample. She thinks her feet are too big. He's saying they're too small. And he's actually stepping on them going, hey, I can't see your feet. Interesting thing. The mother said after that day, the girl never complained about her feet again. She <laughs> started going back out with her friends. Um, another uh, slide of mouth pattern is what we call analogy. 
where instead of, you know, like, uh, you know, analogy is instead of talking about something, I'm using an analogy for it. Um, this example, uh, there was a, a man who had a lot of really severe pain. He had a very, uh, you know, advanced severe form of cancer and no drugs uh, were helping him. And, but Erickson knew that he liked uh, plants and he was a gardener. And so Erickson was talk, started to talk about tomato plants and how comfortable tomato plants could be. And he's talked about sending their roots deep into the earth and how they could draw resources there. And just by talking about this whole thing about tomato plants, uh, he was beginning to shift this person's experience, shift this belief. Uh, and again, this person began to relax and be, had for the first time uh, relief from his, his pain. Another one is we call uh, we call it another outcome. Another outcome means usually we're so focused on one particular kind of result, all of our attention is going there. One of the uh, principles of sleight of mouth is that energy follows attention and that language directs attention. And so uh, this um, was an interesting example of a man who had lost his arm in a in an accident, a work accident and had this excruciating phantom limb pain. And again, for the phantom limb pain, dr drugs don't deal with it because it's not physical. And so they thought, well, they're going to send them to Erickson and see if he could, you know, do this uh, hypnosis to take the pain away. Well, uh, the, and the guy had struggled and, you know, no, nothing seemed to work. But Erickson, when he first saw him, said, well, I think anybody that has endured as much phantom limb pain as you have deserves as me at least as much phantom limb pleasure. So let's first look at phantom limb pleasure. <laughs> so here, by the way, you see that shift uh, as all of these examples, a shift to an outcome frame from a problem frame. And so they started working on, well, what would phantom limb pleasure be like? How would you create phantom limb pleasure? How, what is that? What would that be like? When did you have pleasure with this limbs? What kind of things gives pleasure? Um, Another one that was another example of sort of sleight of mouth is there was this uh, young boy, uh, mother had gotten divorced and probably boy was about eight or nine. Um, and she started was starting to see other people. And this boy became really, um, you know, very willful and was, you know, saying he, he didn't have to do anything his mother said. And, he, you know, he started um, disobeying and causing all kinds of trouble at school and everything. And and whenever she tried to discipline him, he'd just say, I'm a big boy, I can do whatever I want. And so she brought him to Erickson to see if he could help. And of course, Erickson's starting to talk to the boy. And the boy goes, I don't have to listen to you, I can do whatever I want. And he just stamps his foot on the heart as hard as he can on the floor. And so Erickson says, well, a, a big boy would be able to stamp his foot harder than that. So the boy, of course, stamps his foot really hard again. And then Erickson says, well, you know, big boy would be able to stamp that at least 50 times. And the boy starts stamping. So I'm going to stamp a hole in this floor. You know, so he's stamping, stamping, stamping. And of course, after about 30, he's starting to get a little bit tired. And Erickson's saying, well, you know, a big boy would be good to know when he's get tired. He would, you know, he would be able to sit down if he wanted to. You know, big boy would be able to help his mother, you know, and not just, you know, uh, uh, disobey his mother. You know, big boy would be able to talk with adults. So now you get this interesting thing that, this boy is saying, you know, I, we call it applying to itself because I, I'm actually using the, the limiting belief to change itself. <laughs> you know, well, I can do whatever I want. I'm a big boy. Oh, well, then let's see. Uh, and actually, a big boy would want to cooperate. A big boy would know that he can't do everything on his own. Um, finally, uh, what is one we call hierarchy of criteria? And these are just to give you some examples. There's so many Um uh, there's a, another example of a woman who is suffering from a lot of um, very, uh, you know, deep pain from uh, an advanced illness and no drugs seemed to work. And she came in to see Erickson and was saying, well, Sonny, you know, uh, what, what do you think you can do to help me? Uh, nothing else has helped, you know. I mean, they, they, even the doctor said I could combine the strongest, you know, um, the, you know the strongest painkillers and it still doesn't help. And Erickson says to her, well, I can see by your face how much pain you're in. I can see by the way your muscles are tense and everything. He said, but I, I'm curious, how much pain would you feel if you noticed the hungry tiger coming through that door over there right now? And the woman looked over and she said, well, I, I wouldn't feel any pain if I, if I saw a hungry tiger. You know, he said, licking its chops, you know. 
And he said, oh, and she said, and, and then she says, oh, in fact, I'm not feeling any pain right now. And so they made the agreement that she could take the hungry tiger with her, this imaginary hungry tiger home and keep it under her bed. Now, these are just examples of how, again, you can take language and make, you know, you, by the use of words, really shift realities. Now, these, of course, are on an individual level. Uh, a number of the people that I also studied were doing similar things on a more, you know, cultural level or global level. But one of my favorites here is uh, from the, the Bible, where there's a story about Jesus, where uh, they bring a um, a woman who was taken in adultery. It means, you know, she was she, she was you know sleeping with somebody other than her husband, which was considered a horrible thing, and you know she wasn't married to this person and. And they said, now, you know, Moses, the laws of Moses said she should be stoned, which is a horrible way to die. Obviously, she should be killed, you know, but what did you, what did you say? Because, of course, Jesus was supposedly somebody who was preaching peace, who was preaching uh, forgiveness. And they were, but they would have wanted to see what could they get him to sort of say, well, I, I'm against the laws of Moses, which then, you know, that would be, they, they could, you know, blame him for that. So he kind of, as they say, interesting, the description, that he actually is stooped down and is sort of writing on the ground. And they keep asking, well, so what is it? And he stands up and famously says, well, you know, let the one of you who is out without sin then cast the first stone. Which is a very interesting thing to say. Because, again, you notice it doesn't challenge the belief. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's actually taking you to another perspective. And according to the story, that sort of the oldest one <laughs> that was there kind of went out left first, you know, and then all the rest went. And um, so, you know, again, this is this is this notion of applying to self. This was one that actually uh, Jesus, you know, tended to use a lot in the in the descriptions where he'd say, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, why do you see that the speck in that person's eye and not the beam in your own eye? You know, so this kind of looking at your own judgments, applying them to yourself. Uh, Gandhi, we said, was a great example of bringing nonviolence. And one of the complaints often was that, well, nonviolence, you know, it's it's only for people who, uh, you know, are uh, lack courage, you know, you know, otherwise you'd fight. And he said, wait a minute, where do you think more courage is required in, in blowing somebody else up, you know, from behind a cannon or approaching it with a smiling face? Who's the true warrior? You know, the one who's who's you know killing others, or the one who is actually you know having enough courage to you know take the 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 punishment. Uh, so this is what's called a counterexample, uh, and he says, you know, somebody who has no courage could never be a passive resistor. You know, so uh, he said, but he says, however, I will admit that even somebody who is weak in body is capable of it, and you know, uh, one person or a million can do it, or both men and women can do it. So now we see that it sort of turning what seems to be a, a, um, a criticism into an advantage. Um, people like Martin Luther King Jr., uh, you know, was uh, in one of his speeches was talking about, um, you know, what's the right thing to do? I think this was also around uh, during the time of the Vietnam War. And he was saying, well, you know, in some positions, you know, cowardice asks, is it safe? Expediency asks, you know, is it politic? Is it advisable? Vanity says, is it popular? So, but conscience asks, is it right? And there comes a time when you've got to take a position that's neither safe nor politic or popular, but you do it because it's right. So now here, again, you you're, you're get this sense of values and what we call this hierarchy of values, hierarchy of criteria. So you're taking the same situation, but using a different value a different criterion we call it to uh, to uh, perceive it. Lincoln, we mentioned, you know, was uh, used language a lot. He did a lot of um, anti-slavery speeches, and there was this. I mean, this is one where they would they, people would say, "Oh, well, you know, whites are superior, so it's some, somehow it's okay for them to enslave people of color." And he says again, this is an interesting thing about sleight of mouth. Instead of instead of arguing and saying no, you know this is not that way, he says well actually so let's say that's true. Let's say that they were inferior. Uh, isn't it isn't it in, in the gifts of nature? Isn't it the reverse that you should take anything from the little which has been given? Especially this was often done by people who called themselves Christians. You know how could a Christian have a slave? Well, it's okay. He says, um, you know, give to the needy is the Christian rule of slavery. Take from the needy is the is a rule of slavery. 
sorry, Christian rule versus the rule of slavery. So this is doing an interesting thing. He redefines inferior to needy, redefines slavery as taking something, and then saying the consequence of that, though, is that uh, if, if you're truly a good Christian, you would want to be giving to the needy, not taking away. So these, again, are the kinds of things that you see that you're using language in a very, very specific way, in an interesting way. And um, also, here we're only uh, looking at single examples, uh, but you can also use, and, and in the in the books, uh, especially the volume two, I'm showing how people like Lincoln use sequences of them. We call them strategies, where there's not just sort of one, but you're using multiple ones. Um, look at things like Shakespeare's famous um, Mark Antony speech, you know, um, uh, the, the Henry V, when he's uh, getting his people who are outnumbered five to one to actually go into this battle, and, and they have a su surprising and probable victory. Or, uh, you know, Gandhi and, and his whole work towards nonviolence. So, so these are just showing that uh, we we also put these together in um, groupings and that what we call a strategy that is going to lead to a particular kind of an outcome. So, uh, so these are this is some examples of the things that we will be going over in much more detail uh, next February. Uh, these are the two weekends, and there's the uh, place that you can find out more about it. Um, it's a uh, it's the James Bond site, 007, <laughs> 7 007.info. Um, so uh, we're just going to kind of wanted to go over. That's a, an example of some of the things that, um, for, so for, first of all, you know, a little bit of ground of well, what is sleight of mouth, why it's important, how can it, we use it, how has it been used in this program. And what, when we do it, uh, we will be having people, again, starting with some of our own beliefs, where do I get stuck in my own belief system? Uh, which of these confirmation biases, which of these idols, you know, is kind of keeping me trapped? How can I find new perspectives that take me uh, to another place? Uh, so uh, now what I wanted to do, and we do have a few minutes, I was going to see there might be some questions. I always love, uh, and, and during the workshop, obviously, we do, uh, uh, we have extended question and answer periods. And that's always my favorite. That's even where we, we'll do demos. We do demos of this. Um, we give more examples. Uh, we do question and answer. So I'm curious, and I know that Oksana and Richard are probably monitoring our chat. And if you do have a question, uh, we, we'll ha we have the time to at least take maybe a couple. Um, put them in the chat. And, and, and if nobody has a question, I'm sure that Oksana or Richard has a good question. <laughs> so, so, and you can hear me you. now. You guys can hear me. <laughs> we can yeah. hear you well. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank, thank goodness. We, we do have a question from Zlata. Yes. Uh, question for Mr. Dilts. Every time we get online, we automatically get into safe funnels. Is there a yes. basic quick way to distinguish true experts from pseudo experts beneath their personal brands? Yeah, you know, th that's a great question. And and one of the things that I that we, we do in the program and that I, I do in the book is we say, okay, what are some of the, we call it red flags. And to me, and by the way, somebody who's even an expert could still have limiting beliefs. That's part of the problem even. So the fact that they are an expert does not uh, mean <laughs> that they are immune to also some kind of limiting belief. So what I do, in, and we do in the book, is say, okay, what are red flags that let you know, hey, this might not be such a good thing? And for example, those are things I've already mentioned. One, like, is it only talking about a problem and no outcome or solution? Uh, does it tend to, we say, does this tend to just give, we, we call it negative identity messages and, you know, uh, divisiveness and othering. We call it othering, meaning, you know, those people there, blah, blah, blah. Again, even an expert can, can fall prey to that. Um, is it only about a bunch of, is it only words and does not go to any other, we call it other forms of intelligence, you know, uh, 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 you know if it's just all words and there's no data or there's no uh, nothing else to back it up, that's probably another red flag. Uh, another thing we say is this idea of, is it 
only going away from or is it going towards something? So those would be the, the things when I'm looking at these myself, those are the things that I'm looking for. And again, even, even you know, you know, valid experts can have limiting beliefs that I would say, wait a minute, I'm not so sure even they're an expert that I want to take that belief. So I, I hope that helps. Yeah, do we have? I think it does. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I know we did. Unfortunately, that's the problem with doing it this way. We can't actually ask. <laughs> we can't say it. Hey, <laughs> but hopefully. But on the actual workshop, you can ask. That's right. We will have that's possibilities for personal questions to exactly. you and also personal work with you exactly. in the lottery. Exactly. So, we, it, yes, for one more? Call. Yes, yes. So one, one simple question, I think it's a really good one. What are the best ways to practice sleight of mouth in your experience? And another one maybe related, Robert, yeah. how accessible are these patterns conversationally once learned? That's yeah. from Toby and from, uh, yeah, I lost. That, so, so, yeah, first of all, um, first of all, they are uh, from Jordy. From Jordy. So first of all, yeah, you can use them conversationally. I'll, I'll give you an interesting example. You can use them in a coaching conversation. I was just talking to uh, to a colleague of mine who was we were sharing about this, and he was talking about a coaching situation he did with somebody recently, who um, was talking about you know in their life that when they were what I guess when this person was um, about eight, their his parents split up, and partially the the father had to be escorted away, and he grew up in this place and went you know, and he he couldn't stand this family system. And so when he was saying, oh, when I was 16, you know, I went and, I, you know, I, I left home and I stayed on a cousin's, uh, you know, bed and stuff. And my friend just simply conversationally said, oh, wow, so so you didn't end up on the street. Now, that's a simple little thing, but, you know, you realize, yeah, I guess I didn't end up on the street. You know, that was started something that, you know, was actually, I, I was able to start to take care of my own life. So it's it, instead of it being the story of a problem it then starts to become the story of how I was able to build my own life. So, so yes, I mean, the interesting thing is even just a little bit of a comment like that can really sort of shift perspective, you know, kind of thinking, oh, I have a hard life story to, wow, actually this, this has been uh, fascinating. I, one of the people I profile in the volume two is Oprah Winfrey who, as, as you may know, you know, she's uh, started life as uh, a um, illegitimate child, you know, to an unwed mother in poverty, you know, so she's, you know, African-American woman in poverty. This is not the profile of who you would expect to become the first woman, especially woman of color billionaire. <laughs> so what did she do? And a lot of the, what she does is it's her, her way of looking at her life and her experiences. And she says, you know, if you talk about something as a struggle, it's a struggle that so I started talking about my, you know, my, my path as an honor, then it's an honor. It's, it's, a, it has challenges, but it's an honor. So just those kind of things can make a huge difference. And, and about how to practice, you know, practicing is I do things like, you know, but you, you want to do a get get good slide of mouth practice. You know, look at some of the. Um, I mean, when I look at my news feed, you know, the po politician statements. Uh, you know, I, I start looking at, uh, and what I've done is look at also uh, literature. What are where what are where are things where people have actually made a difference in the world? I, I spend a lot of time, for example, looking at things like uh, Martin Luther King's Jr.'s "I Have a Dream" speech. Oh. Well, that that made a big difference. Um, you can also another important thing practicing is realizing that you know sleight of mouth, as I said, is a double edged sword. Uh, people like Hitler use sleight of mouth as well, you know, and you use certain words, you know, to talk about people, and and if uh, you know, you hear these these like I said these negative identity judgments, you know, you talk about people as a scourge, you you know, it, then you start going hmm. I'm recognizing as I'm reading these things or as I'm hearing these things that these that these things are patterns are starting to pop out. And usually what you're going to find is that uh, um, people, especially well-known people, you know, who we, we hear a lot, they'll use certain patterns a lot and, of course, have blind spots to others. And then it's really interesting just to start um, and, 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 you know, 
looking and listening. And the way that I practice, and maybe this is the key here to the answer, is I always have a question. So I don't just kind of look at something and go, I wonder what's, you know, is this light of mouth? I go, okay, you know, is, you know, what's my question here? What question do I have about this? Uh, you know, maybe is, is there a blind spot here? Is there something that's being repeated here? Is there a red flag? How many red flags are here? So that's often the way that I'm practicing because I, I want to use it in a very pragmatic way. You know, I'm, I'm not just doing it because, oh, well, it's, you know, a sleight of mouth is fun or it's interesting. It is, but, you know, it, it it's very um, relevant to our lives. Another thing that I do, if you really want to practice is listen to yourself, <laughs> Listen to when you kind of are defensive or you feel bad or something, what are you saying? <laughs> so I kind of have my own, I try to get my own little inner virus detection, <laughs> you know, observer going on. So I always, I think everything that I do with NLP or any of the things I've developed, I always practice with me first, because that's where it's, first of all, that's where it's going to make the best difference. And then secondly, that's also where I really get to know the, the value and the impact of it. So, uh, you know, I know we got, uh, we because of the sound, we got off to a little bit later start. So maybe we could even just go a little later, do one more. I know that. Uh, oh, we, uh, we, we can continue. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, thank you for very your, much. For your kindness. Yeah. So there's a, a quite a few questions about the new volume. Yes. Flight of Mouth 2. Yes. When is it coming out? And also, uh, what's the main difference between the first volume and the second volume? Uh, so. Oh. Those are great questions. <laughs> so I, I'm actually, I'm actually, I, I think I was sharing with you both. I'm actually done with the body of it. It's all, you know, the, the main part is all laid out. There's just a few, you know, details that need to be done. So I, I'm thinking that probably, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be ready to go to publication by the end of this month and certainly would be out by the end of the year. So it will be wow. out or before the program in February. What's the difference between that and volume one? Um, so one of the things I'm doing with volume two is I, I do, uh, I do review all of the patterns and I, what I, but I review them with a special, you know, I, I have, a I have examples, you know, historical examples of each one. I have an Erickson example for each one, how he used this in, in a personal change, uh, setting. I have a joke at least, or, you know, or a humorous anecdote for each one, because a sleight of mouth is also the basis for a lot of humor. So, and, and there's a question because one of the things I point out is that ultimately sleight of mouth itself, yes, it's words, but how do you find the words? Well, you find the words because you're using a particular mindset. Uh, and I, I said, you're asking a question. So there's also a question that's, that sort of focuses the mindset for each one. Then probably one of the big differences is that I'm also showing how you use them in combinations in order to achieve certain kinds of outcomes. For example, in we, so we have examples, uh, and, and in the example section, uh, you have, for instance, what, we know we've heard about the Socratic method. Well, what is the Socratic method? Well, we know it's about questions, but how do you know which questions to ask? And so in this, I, I go over, you know, some of uh, the Plato's dialogues, the Socratic dialogues, and I'm saying, look, here's this pattern of how Socrates is using these particular sleight of mouth patterns over and over and over again as he's, you know, exploring these different uh, issues. Uh, as I said, you know, there's also examples of how, what kind of I was showing on some of those slides, uh, how, you know, uh, Gandhi would use a whole series of them in, to, in order to really create and um, and promote his belief system of nonviolence. Similarly, with some of these others, with the uh, uh, one of the one of the ones that's my, one of my favorite parts is sort of Oprah Winfrey talking about her journey and how she is promoting these positive beliefs and also kind of reframing these thought viruses about well you know because of your circ you know you can't succeed because of your circumstances and says well wait a minute you know is that the case and and so it's very interesting uh, so kind of looking at these pragmatic aspects of how you use uh, not just one sleight of mouth pattern, but a group of them in order to accomplish a particular result. So. Uh, thank you very much. Robert, it is such, it's such a, an interesting presentation tonight. I, I just, just listened 
uh, with, with great interest. And, and there's so many people writing in chat. It's just people are going crazy. You know, you're just thanking you and telling you how useful, how interesting. And, uh, and of course, a lot of questions are, are, are you know, accumulating. But I think we're going to have to uh, draw to a close here because uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I kind of has uh, just... Okay. Yeah, as a about the actual workshop which is coming up in uh, next February, mm -hmm. we have a couple of announcements. First of all, next forty eight hours you will be able to register for the lowest price for the for the for, full workshop. Yeah, four, four days. Four hours, uh, it's the lowest, lowest price. price. So you yes. Five hundred forty-five dollars now, and yeah. it'll be going up to five hundred ninety-five dollars in forty-eight hours. So, but if even if you watch this webinar later, you you can uh, go to the website, which is on the frame of webinar. It's seven zero zero seven, and uh, you can take a look. You you always can join us. The registration is going to be open even after forty eight hours uh, finished. Uh, the price is including also, of course, uh, online participation live in the workshop with Robert in uh, in uh, big Zoom. All of us, all our big inspired group, and be a big Zoom. <laughs> yeah, people already joining. Uh, also, you will able to sign up to the lottery for the demonstration with Robert for personal coaching work. And and three months uh, free access to the videos afterwards Included. with the possibility of, of renewing it uh, for a modest yes. fee. Yes. And uh, also the price is including uh, slides in PDF format and also uh, uh, Manual. worksheets. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, PDF, and PDF manual, I think, as well, too. Yeah. Yeah, manual. So it's it's really really interesting material. I already saw them, and um, it's fantastic. It's, it's fantastic. And, so interesting. And uh, also, we have a, a little surprise for you. If you subscribe for reg for this webinar, if you registered. Then you will have when when, when you register when you yeah. when you register <laughs> you will you will get an email from us with the, also gift from Robert. It's an audio recording of yes. the audio guide for coach state for wholeness for wholeness. Oh, that's really a good one. That's yeah. that's really great. Yeah. And several uh, uh, months ago, we prepared a special interview with Robert uh, for you. It's a slide of mouse, 43 years. 43 year anniversary, yeah. It's we are years. going to publish it very soon, just in a couple of days uh, on this very channel. And also we will send you uh, this uh, the link on uh, your email, an interview. If you registered on this webinar, you will get also email. So please join us. We will and join us on our Telegram, official Robert Dilt slide of mouse Telegram channel. The all links are right uh, down on the description. Uh, Just open the description, yeah, and uh, then you can under YouTube here. Yeah. yeah, under so open up the information. Everything's there for you, and it's going to be, it's going to be a very exciting program, and it's an, an international one. You can see us; we are an international family, <laughs> <laughs> judging by my own English by version. The international English. <laughs> international English. And, and, so, and, and Oksana, I think that's an important thing. You don't have to be a native speaker to to appreciate and to use it. That's why I say it's really a, it's really about a mindset. And so, yeah, as long as long as you um, are able to to use language, you will benefit from this. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we are very very excited about this uh, this whole side of mouse series of series. events. Series, yeah. And, um, we're, we're we're hoping that excuse me, just hoping Robert that you would agree uh, sometime in the future after we do the first workshop to to do a, another workshop about the second slide of mouth. Yes, we, we do the, the do the advanced workshop, and you know, as you know, we've even talked about the slide of mouth workshop three. <laughs> so, exactly. Uh, there's so it's going lot, to I mean, be. You know, one of the things that that is happening, I just would say too, is. And, the, and the, uh, there's another thing that volume two does is volume two also shows how 
when you use sleight of mouth patterns with strategies of genius, which is another series, that's where you get this amazing combination. And so yeah. uh, we go over to that in, in this in this advanced program. And then, you know, we where there's a we, we have a whole plan for our um, our you know number three because it's really a developing right now. It's, I mean, it's it's so it's so key to our world today, and it's really kind of synthesizing a lot of by bringing together a number of different things. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's it's something that is going to really keep uh, you know keep blossoming, keep growing, and so uh, it's a movement. Mm -hmm. so. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I people are asking so many questions. I just wanted to write here in the in the chat on YouTube that you all the all the information is in the HTTP or www seven zero zero seven info. It, all the questions are answered there. Guys. Yeah, and it's a very well. I want I, I want to say it's a very well done website. I was like, looking at this, going, wow. Even if this wasn't my program, I would be wanting to come to this. It's it is, <laughs> and it's it's true. I think what. What you provide oh, there really you. does give a really good uh, description of what um, of what's happening and and also all the details. Thank so. you, Robert. Thank yeah. you very much. It was so interesting this evening. What a great great taste of what's what's waiting for us. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm so I, well, much I hope to see, I hope to see something program. that we didn't. I don't get. I don't get to see directly here. We'll get to see you in February if you come on the Zoom because we'll all be seeing each other on the Zoom. And um, yeah, so let's 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 make February <laughs> a uh, a uh, a celebration together. Yeah, mark it down in your calendar, guys. And we will we will have also after actual workshop after Robert classes. We also will have every day a networking session for right. people to to get acquainted to connect all around the world. All specialists, all people who have been interested in personal growth too, because this workshop, it's not only for coaches, uh, psychotherapists, uh, and mm -hmm. other people for help helping professions. It's also for people from business, for personal growth. So we, have, we will have audience from all different spheres of human actions. <laughs> Great. Great. It's... We're so much looking forward to it. Yes. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Right, good night, everybody. Or good day. Have a good rest of the day, wherever you are. And uh, thank you, Oksana and Richard. And also the team. Thank our, you, Robert. Okay. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>